<clears throat> Hello, everyone. This is Jeff Hyman. I just want to do a quick audio check and video check. If you could type in the chat box, I would be very grateful if you can hear me okay, see me okay. We will get started right on time at 6 o'clock Central. Uh, but if you can just type in the chat box, give me a thumbs up, and I look forward to getting started with you in just a few. Good evening, everyone, from a very soggy Chicago. Uh, this is Jeff Hyman. I'm your host tonight, and I just wanted to make sure that we could do a quick audio check, video check before we get started. If you're on a few minutes early, I really appreciate it. Just type in the chat box, please, if you can hear me, if you can see me, and we will get started in just about five minutes or so. Great. Well, it looks like we've got audio, we've got video, we've got plenty of water, and we are going to cover a ton of stuff in the next hour. Uh, we've been doing these uh, for various groups, and I'm really excited to uh, spend time with you all tonight and the Kellogg Alumni Club of Chicago. So we'll give people just a few minutes to get started. Grab yourself a drink, uh, and uh, we'll get started in about five minutes.
Okay, everyone, good evening or good afternoon. Uh, I am Jeff Hyman, and I uh, am thrilled to be joining you uh, today. We're going to spend uh, the next hour going through some what I hope will be very useful, very direct uh, thoughts. Uh, I have been uh, sharing some of this content with a lot of groups here over the past month, and uh, the response has been pretty good, so I was thrilled to be asked to share it with you, and uh, that's what we'll do. Uh, at the end of the session, I'm more than happy to stay on for questions. Uh, definitely ask questions as we go, but just understand that if it's something we're probably going to get to, I might punt on it until we get to the end of the session, and then I am happy to spend all evening on questions. We can go as late as you want. I got a bunch of bottles of water here, <laughs> so... Uh, as late as you want to go on q and I'm more than happy to. I'll also give you my contact info later. I'll give you my email address. If you have any you know, follow-up questions that we didn't get to, uh, I'm happy to do that as well. So I uh, want to do one last final audio and video check. If you could just type in the chat box, let me know if you can hear me okay, if you can see me okay, and, uh, and then we're going to get started here uh, in just a moment. While we're waiting, uh, I uh, was in a session earlier today uh, with um, uh, Liza Kirkpatrick, who heads up the Career Services Center uh, at the university or at Kellogg, and uh, she did a phenomenal job. You know, she and her team are working so hard to help the current students that have been impacted uh, by the current events, and uh, just a great resource for you, for you to tap into. So don't forget. Uh, about Liza and her team uh, at Kellogg. Of course, they're doing it all remotely. I give them a ton of credit. Uh, it's quite remarkable uh, what they've done. So uh, with all that, why don't we get started? Uh, again, I'm Jeff Hyman, and um, uh, I am thrilled to be with you. Uh, I have tried a couple times to uh, give over control of the webinar to our host, Diana, and I want to uh, really thank Diana and the entire Kellogg Alumni Club of Chicago um, and, and the board there. Uh, they've done a terrific job. And um, unfortunately, uh, Diane is on the call, but I haven't been able to figure out how to switch it over. So she did ask me to share just a couple of things. Um, you know, this uh, tonight's session is kind of a, a reboot of an in-person session that we were going to do with many of you uh, in middle of March. And of course, that was postponed and canceled due to obvious events. And, you know, I, I give the board a lot of credit for focusing on the safety of the group. Uh, but the Kellogg Alumni Club of Chicago has a ton of resources. Make sure you're following the newsletter and following the events that will be upcoming. They've got some great content from some other professors as well. So Diana and board, thank you so much for inviting me to participate this evening. Uh, but she also asked me to let you know that you'll be getting a survey uh, of this event later this week and you know, would love your feedback as well. So, uh, so with that said, uh, you know, I'm happy to get started. We are going to cover a lot of stuff in the next hour. And uh, again, I'm your host, Jeff Hyman, uh, Kellogg alum and Kellogg professor, and uh, we're going to focus and get right to it. So you're in the right place if you are currently actively looking for your next role. Uh, even if you're not, if you're just worried about your firm stability, maybe you're thinking about your next role, this is also, I think, going to be a very useful session for you. Maybe you just want more confidence. And, uh, you know, I will tell you that my style is pretty straight. Uh, I'm from New York originally. And so uh, I'm going to give it to you straight as I see it. And hopefully by the end of the session, uh, that will be, uh, you know, specific actionable things that you can take away uh, and put to use in your job search. Uh, I call it the superhero job search. And I do that because by the end of this hour, your job search is going to be faster than it would have been before. You're going to actually be able to get through it and get this done. It's going to be very powerful. You're going to outrank other candidates who may be interested in the same jobs, and you'll be able to leap tall buildings. I'm not sure about that one, but that's why I call it the superhero job search. I'll send you the slides. I'll send you the deck. I'll send you the video, but I really want to ask you to engage with me for the next hour. And if you can stick with me, I'm going to share with you a lot of the mistakes that I see people make and what you can do. And basically, you have to go through this process completely differently. Differently than you have in the past, because you've never looked for a job in this kind of environment. 
and also differently than other people. Most people that I see looking for a job right now are going about it completely the wrong way. And so I want to give it to you straight from someone who's been a headhunter for 25 years uh, and share with you what's working. And that's the the, the truth that we're going to share tonight. Um, I've been very fortunate to work in recruiting for 25 years, but I think what's more important is I've been a CEO four times. And so I can share with you the view of a hiring manager and what CEOs and other uh, top executives are looking for even these days. Uh, all told, I've worked on recruiting over 3,000 people. So I've kind of seen this movie before, maybe not this particular movie that we're all living through, um, but I, that's the, the perspective that I bring with you, uh, bring to you tonight. Uh, also happy to give you a free copy of my book just for participating and you'll get more information on that later. So with all that said, what I want to cover in the next hour for you is a step-by-step -step roadmap of how to find your next job. I'm going to share with you where the opportunities are, specific industries and companies that need you. Believe it or not, there are people hiring, a lot of people. I'm also going to share with you, like I said, the biggest mistakes that people make. And then finally, we're going to talk about the LinkedIn profile because that is one of the keys that kind of opens up your job search. So we're going to cover all that and some other stuff too. And then, like I said, at 7 o'clock Central, roughly, uh, we will get to Q&A. So type in the chat box if that's going to be helpful. This is completely live. You're going to ask questions as we go. You can ask questions as, as, as we get to the end. Just ask questions. I want to be as helpful to you as possible. But type in the chat box if that kind of information would be useful to you. And then we will get started. Okay, awesome. I'm getting a lot of yeses. So we're all in the right place. Let's do it. Uh, I tell you this 30 second story just for perspective that I have gone through what you are going through or what you're about to go through. Uh, as I was graduating from Kellogg, there were no tech companies that came to campus, but I wanted a tech company. I wanted to work in Silicon Valley. So I had to go about it myself. And I went about this off-campus job search, much like what other people do and what you're kind of going to do. And I had to develop my targets and I had to develop a funnel and I had to close deals, just like a great salesperson does. This is sales. And I got seven offers. Now, some of that was luck, I'm sure, but the point is it absolutely can be done if you have a process and if you stick to that process. I've been in your seats. I understand what you're going through. Over the past 38 days, our world has completely changed. It would be silly not to acknowledge that. We, of course, have this, this health crisis, and that is in and of itself horrific, and that has in turn generated this economic crisis. So we're dealing with a, a twofer. And what I see happening, I believe, is just the beginning. You know, we've all, of course, seen the restaurants and the hotels and airlines uh, shut down or dramatically uh, scale back and lose business. But you also have to remember that that's just the beginning. And the reason I say that is because there's a domino effect to all these things. As consumer spending goes down, as company spending goes down, it trickles through the whole economy. We're just now beginning to see how big the, the recession will be. Some believe it'll be a depression. And so it's really important to kind of start from that point of view. And, uh, you know, you can use these numbers as, as a quick data point. Uh, and this was announced, you know, just the other day that we're at a, probably a 13 to 14% unemployment rate. Compare that to 38 days ago, we were at a 3.5% unemployment rate. So we've never seen that before, of course. And some people think it will be bigger than the Great Depression and, and beyond. But it's also important to understand that it may not last long. And it's also important to understand that there are still companies hiring today. So don't let this overarching message bum you out that we're at a 15% unemployment rate. What matters is you and your situation and taking action. And that's what I want to help you do today. But it is important to acknowledge that this is basically an economic tsunami and it's coming. Part of it's already here. It's reached the shore, but we're going to see these trickling waves come in and what you can't afford to do is hide. Some people, that's what they're doing. Or you can win and I want to help you win. Now, I say that because I've seen through three recessions. Part of the advantage of being old and gray like me is 
you've seen the movie before and I've been through three recessions. And so I kind of remember uh, be, from institutional memory what it feels like, what it, how it happens, how it kind of trickles through the economy. Now, nothing has ever been like this one before, of course, but they all have some things in common. In the recession, there is still opportunity. There's opportunity for companies. They can still sell a product. They can still pivot. I'm seeing it happen every day as I talk to CEOs. And there is opportunity for you, whether you're looking for a job or thinking of looking for a job. Companies' volumes are going through the roof. Amwell, which is a telehealth business. Zoom, video. Walmart, Amazon, stocks that are at all-time high. So there's not, it's not hard to find these data points of success and of opportunity. Don't let the macro environment be your excuse and fall into inaction. That's the worst thing that you can do. What I would say that I see happening is a value migration. It's kind of a job dislocation, right? A lot of people laying off, cutting back, trimming. Others scaling up, hiring, <laughs> ramping as fast as they can. And that creates opportunity. It also creates change. You have to be okay with that change, but it does create opportunity. you got to stay calm. Panic in this kind of environment will get you nowhere. And I understand the tendency to do that. I understand the inclination, but it's not going to solve anything. And so some of the biggest mistakes I see people making are they're panicking. They don't have a plan. And what often they do is they move to a direct competitor. And that competitor, who may be open to hiring you, is dealing with the same issues. They're in the same segment, the same sector, the same customers. So they're facing the same macro trends. So this may be the time that you may need to shift to another sector as opposed to just going to a competitor. Another mistake people make is they just take a role out of desperation without doing the proper due diligence. If you don't know what you're getting into and things get tough, you know that the last one in is often the first one out. So you don't want to go into an unstable situation. And that can happen if you're not doing your due diligence. Another mistake people make is they wait for the perfect situation. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but that is not going to be a strategy that works right now. It worked 38 days ago. I worked with candidates that had four offers in the course of a week, but it doesn't work anymore. Uh, and then spending hours noodling and playing with your resume to get it just perfect. That is not going to make the difference. That's not going to get you a great new job. So a lot of mistakes you can make. My goal is to help you avoid them. Type in the chat box one last time if you're with me. Just say yes if you are engaged and you're awake and you're going to commit to me to avoid these mistakes. And I will show you exactly step by step how we're going to get there. Okay. Yes is absolutely thumbs up. Awesome. Great. So let's do it. It's important to remember that you don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to outrun the guy behind you. And I can tell you that I still see people with less talent than you, with less background than you, with less education than you, and they're getting great jobs. It's happening. So don't let the macro environment and the headlines scare you from even trying. That will not work. Now, you got to start from a position of knowing where you're at. And so there's two key numbers that you need to know. The first is for your company, let's say you're currently working. It's important to understand is your company profitable or not? And the rate that it's burning cash, the strength of its balance sheet. A lot of people say that in good times, it's a P&L game. And in rough times, like we're in right now, it's a balance sheet game. If your company taking Apple as an example, with $30 billion on, ca uh, on cash on hand, they're in pretty good shape. They're going to weather this storm. If you're at a startup that's unprofitable, can't raise money, and you're two months from going out of business, it's important to kind of know that. And I'd be surprised by how many people don't know the cash burn rate of their company. That's your responsibility to actually know. Second, it's important to know your cash burn rate at home. That's going to tell you how selective that you can afford to be. If you have a rich uncle or you just won the lottery and you got a lot of money in the bank, you can be pretty selective. If you're six weeks away from real trouble, it's important to know that you may not be able to hold out for the perfect job. So you got to know these two numbers 
and many people don't. And that's where it begins. We're going to develop a strategy that assumes really ugly worst case stuff. And if we and if we beat that, if the recession somehow lifts faster than people think, if the virus somehow finds a cure, great. But I don't want you to assume those things. That's where people get into trouble. And I saw that in the 2008 recession. I saw that in the 2001 recession over and over. So what should you assume? The basic conclusion I've come to is if you don't have a better idea for your company and your industry, the question to ask yourself is what would happen if our company's revenue was down 40% for the next year? Now, I know that sounds crazy. It sounds pretty dire, especially when you compare it to other companies where, you know, revenue is up right now. Uh, Grubhub, right? Going through the roof. Everyone's delivering food. Mine will be here in a couple hours. But then you have restaurants where you have hotels where rest where revenue is down 95%. So if you don't know what to assume, assume it's down 40% and then rerun the numbers and understand what happens to your balance sheet and your company's run rate because it's a pretty good safe bet. It's going to be impacted by that kind of magnitude. Presuming your company can withstand that kind of trauma, that kind of shock to the system, people ask me this question every day. If I have a job, should I stay in it? Even if I'm unhappy, should I stay in it? And I will tell you that 38 days ago, my answer was no, life's too short. You can get four offers in a week, put your, you know, put yourself out there and let's see what we can find. Now I will be very honest and tell you that if you are in a role that is tolerable at a solid company, meaning the balance sheet is strong, it's profitable. You're not going to run out of money, even if revenue is down 40% the next year. My basic conclusion is you should stay put. You have found, maybe by luck, a port in the storm. And there is a lot to be said for that. Now, that shouldn't bum you out if you're not in that situation. But just know that if you are, and I think some of you are, maybe you're not happy with your boss. Maybe you're not happy with the industry. Maybe long term, there's nowhere to go career path wise. This is a once in a lifetime event. We shouldn't we we may have to set your career on the back burner for a few months or a few quarters and just understand that a port in the storm is worth a lot right now. And the reason is if you make a move and you go to another company and God forbid it has trouble, you know what happens. You remember the scene from Titanic, everyone's scrambling for the lifeboats. There's not enough lifeboats to go around, right? Women and children first and then it's every man for himself and the first one the last one in to a company may be the first one out. And I don't want that to happen to you. So just know that if you have something that's less than perfect, think twice, think three times about making a change. Now, if you have decided to make a change or if you're currently not working, let's get to it because the first thing you got to do is think about your target. This is probably the biggest mistake that I see job seekers make, especially during times like this. The logic goes, I'll talk to anybody. I'll send my resume to everyone. I'll, you know, play the numbers game. And I'll talk to 100 companies, 1,000 companies. I'll send my resume. And believe it or not, it doesn't work. It's no different than a marketing class you might take. And the first thing you learn is you got to know who your target customer is. And then you develop your whole campaign around that target customer. And it works. But if you have no target customer or you don't know who it is or you just say, let's just advertise to everybody, it doesn't work because you haven't positioned yourself appropriately and that doesn't resonate with the target. So you don't have long to develop this target. I'm going to give you an exercise that you can by this Friday, the day after tomorrow, know exactly what your target is. And it goes like this. There's three questions we need to answer and we're looking for the intersection of this Venn diagram. The first question, what are you top 5% at? In this market, that's what it takes to get hired. So being very honest with yourself about what are you great at? I don't mean good. I don't mean average, slightly above average. The thing, And everyone has it, right? So do some deep soul searching. Ask your spouse, ask your partner, ask your roommate, ask your former boss, whatever it is. Know what you're amazing at. Second, what do you love doing? And that also means what do you love in general? If you love pets, if you love uh, uh, logistics, if you love number crunching, what do you love doing? The third question, probably the most important right now, in this environment, how can you create value? This answer may be very different than it was 38 days ago. 
What will people pay you to do? If you're one of the top 5% origami folders, world-class, and you love origami, I got news. Tough to find someone that's going to pay you to do origami. 38 days ago, I bet you could have found it somewhere, right? So it's super important to be very honest and clear. Write this down. I'll send it to you at the end of the session. And by Friday, have your answer. And that is your target. Now, the closer your target is to one of these three things, the better off you're going to be. And I call them makers, shakers, and takers. Let me explain what this is. Makers are the people who create your your product, a company's product. They deliver the service. The company would be out of business without them because they, they make it. The shakers are the ones who sell it. They get customers. And by the way, that doesn't mean that you, you have to be in sales. That can be marketing roles, direct marketing roles, not brand building roles, but direct marketers who fill the top of the funnel with leads, qualified leads for the sales team. And then takers are the people that count the cash right? The cash is the oxygen of the company. And if you're somehow touching or counting the cash or collecting the cash, believe it or not, if you're in accounts receivable right now, your job's pretty safe. So the further you are from these three types of roles, the more at risk you are, or the harder it is to find those roles because they are staff roles. And in a down market, companies often stop investing in those positions. So type right now in the chat box, if you see a path to being a maker or a shaker or a taker, type one of those three words. And yes, you have to pick one. So pick which one you're going to focus on. And then I'm going to help you lay out the plan to actually go out and find it. I don't want to get dry here. Okay. So I see a lot of makers. Some shakers. A couple question marks. Okay, you got some work to do. A uh, couple of takers, maybe finance and accounting. Good. Super important to think about this because this is where the jobs are. You're looking for the target, the bullseye, the intersection of those three questions. Now, once you know your target, rather than doing what most individuals do, which is run around like a chicken with their head cut off, talk to any company, take any meeting, take any interview they can. I would encourage you to do the opposite. And what that means is to determine your minimum viable position, your MVP. This is the position that you are willing to take, that you're willing to accept. It may not be your dream job. It may not be as much money as you might like. It may not be with the sexiest company in the world. But if you found it tomorrow, you would take that job. Here's why it's important to know your MVP. 38 days ago, if you passed on an opportunity, you probably were going to get another one two days later or a week later or a month later. Right now, in this storm, if you pass on an opportunity that's right in front of your face, you may not see the next one for a month or a quarter. I hate to say it, six months, which goes back to knowing what your burn rate is so you understand how low that bar needs to be or how high it can be. But know your MVP and write it down, the industry, the sector, the job, the title, the compensation. What are you willing to accept? I'm not saying settle for anything. Life is too short. But you may have to acknowledge that that MVP may look very different than your dream job 38 days ago. And the sooner you come to that reality, the sooner you grasp that reality, the better off you'll be. A lot of people still 38 days later are still in fantasy land. They're still looking for their dream job. And sadly, they may be looking for quite some time. 38 days ago, you were the buyer. You are now the seller. It has flipped from 3.5% unemployment to 15% unemployment. Never happened before. Probably never going to happen again in our lifetime, but deal with it. And if you can find that port in the storm and it clears your MVP, take it. Or at least think twice, three times before you pass. And I'll be honest, something may have to give. It may be the right role in the wrong company, or it may be the wrong city, or maybe you want to move to California from Chicago, but that's not the right time to do that right now. People in California can't interview you, for starters. And are you really going to get it on an airplane? So you got to be realistic. And that's what an MVP is. Now, 
when I give this counsel to people, I'm often asked this question. What are people going to think in a year or three or five years? What's a headhunter going to think? What's a CEO going to think that I took this job? And I'm going to tell you that you're going to get the biggest hall pass of your career for this year, for 2020. No one is ever going to question, as long as it was somewhat logical, the job that you took. It's just not going to happen. Everyone is living through this whole thing. No one's going to ever forget it. You have a hall pass. I'm not saying take a crappy opportunity. I'm saying be realistic and understand the bird in hand. Maybe we're 20 in the bush right now. As you think about the industries and companies, I'm encouraging you to think about what you learned in Psych 101. Remember way back when we learned about Maslow. And we rem remember that your physiological needs need to get met first. That's water, food, sleep, clothing. Right. Then you go to safety, your physical safety, your health, and you work your way up. What happens in a recession is people clamp back down to the bottom of the pyramid. So groceries, CPG products, I'll go through a list in a minute. And over time, as the economy improves, people start to go back to self-actualization, be all you can be. So you really need to ask, is this sector, is this company marketing a vitamin or a medicine? A medicine is something people must have. They can't live without it. A vitamin, eh, it's opportunistic. They can live without it. It's discretionary. Those are very dangerous sectors to be in right now. Even if you can get a job, the question will be, can you keep the job? Will the company actually survive this time period? So I promised you industries that are doing great. There's a lot of them. Too many to mention. I'm not even going to go through all these, but I'll randomly pick up some examples. Streaming, any kind of streaming, any kind of home entertainment, rethinking education, rethinking senior services, rethinking transportation, all the lawsuits that are about to result through this pandemic, which will be in every industry, contracts broken, sadly, healthcare disputes, all of that will create opportunity in businesses, consulting firms that consult to these industries, the mortgage industry, the refi industry. It's endless. So you have to know where to look, but don't believe the headlines that no one's hiring, no one's looking. There are companies that are booming and accelerating and also, don't forget, reinventing themselves. If you can help be part of that solution, you'll be way down the path. So a lot, of a lot to think about in terms of industries. The next thing to think about is location. I'm generally advising people to focus on two locations. One is where you live now. If you live in Chicago, even if your goal is to get to California, even if your goal is to move to New York or retire in Florida, I would encourage you to think about finding your next role in Chicago. The logistics of that are I'm finding much, much easier. As soon as a lockdown is over in a particular location, that company is going to want to meet you. You probably don't want to hop on an airplane and be commuting. You probably don't want to stay at hotels. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. That's up to you, but it's certainly going to be hard. The other alternative is the extreme opposite, which is companies that are 100% virtual. I mean, companies that are going to stay 100% virtual at the end of this phase. That's another option. But doing a long distance job search right now is proving to be extremely difficult. I'm working with a number of clients, a number of employers, and we've basically decided we're only going to focus on local candidates for all these reasons. So I understand you may want to make a move geographically. My advice is to think twice about investing your time to do that. Type in the chat box if you're with me. We're, we're, we're right in the heart of it now. We're coming up on halfway done, but I got a lot more I want to go through. We'll open it up to questions. I promise at the end, because I want to make sure I cover every single question. But type in the chat box if you're with me. I know it may be sobering. I may not. I know it may not be exactly what you want to hear, but I promised you at the beginning that I would give it to you straight and no BS, and that's what I want to do. Okay, thank you for sticking with me. Let's keep going. So we talked about industry. We talked about location. Now I want to talk about how you're actually going to find this. So in the past, what in successful individuals did to find a job would be 
figure out the job that they wanted to pursue, and then they would figure out, okay, how do I network my way to that job? And that was a viable strategy, right? Right now, what works better is the opposite. Again, remember I told you at the beginning, we're pretty much going to do the opposite of what everyone else does. Same thing here. I want you to do the opposite. Think about your network, your personal network. And I'm going to get very specific on this in a minute. I'm going to blow your mind by how big your network is. And use that network to find your next role. So again, opposite. We're not saying, okay, I want this job. How do I network my way to it? We're starting with your existing network. If you haven't dug your well and now you're thirsty, it's too late. So we have to start with your, your, your existing network. But I'll bet you it's bigger than you think. Your network consists of so many people that by Friday, I'd like you to write this down. If you take away nothing else from this session, spend time activating your network. And to do that, you have to spend time writing down your network. So let's, let's rack your brain for a minute. This is every manager you've ever had. Write it down. I don't care if you hated their guts. <laughs> Write it down. Every mentor you ever had. And that, by the way, could mean, you know, department heads that weren't quite your manager, but you worked very closely with them. So you reported to the VP of marketing, but you remember your VP of sales. Write him down. Every former peer that you can remember it, every employer that you've worked with, write it down. Every investor and board member at those companies, same thing, especially if it was a good outcome and you made the money, they will take your call. They will remember. Every former customer that you worked with, even if you were in sales, write down all the customers, write down all the customers that you never closed, but you developed a relationship with and you remember them and you think they might remember you, write it down. Vendors, your CRM vendor, your manufacturing components vendors, your accounting firms, your consulting firm, write them all down. Every person at every one of those firms, if you worked with you know, PwC as your auditor and you worked with seven people on the audit team, write them all down. So we already have a long list. I'm gonna guarantee you by you finish this exercise, I'll bet your list will be 500 people or more. We're gonna add to that, former uh, alumni or students that you went to school with, both grad and undergrad, write them down. You didn't like them? I don't care. Write them down. It's a lot of people. Take out your Facebook, your pig book, whatever, and rack your brain. Sorry, I haven't talked to you in 30 years, but write them down. Then on top of that, we're going to dump in your first degree LinkedIn connections. Now, if you're like a lot of people, your LinkedIn connections, and I, I have 30,000, I'm, I'm maxed out actually, but you know, some of them are people you know and will take your call and you've worked with and others are kind of strangers you never really knew, but you clicked accept. I'm talking about the ones that, you know, you have some connection to. Write it down. You can actually export them. Just do a Google search. How do I export my LinkedIn network? You can actually export your LinkedIn network to an Excel or to a Google Sheet and then start with that. Guaranteed it's, you know, 100 to 500 to thousands. Delete all the people who you don't really know. Add all these others. We're up to 500. We're up to 1,000 people. It's a lot of people. But it's just a list of people, okay? Don't alphabetize it. Let's do something with it that's actually useful. And I want you to characterize each person three ways. Number one, do they know me? Do they actually know me? And by that, I mean, if I call them, would they say, oh, I, I know Jeff? Or would they say, Jeff? Who the hell's Jeff, right? Not that useful. Rate them one to three, right? One, they don't know me. Two, they kind of know me. Three, I talked to them last week, right? One, two, three. Number two, love me. Do they love me? Do they think highly of me? Do I have reason to believe that they are impressed by my abilities, my talents? Maybe I made them money or do they hate me? Hate me gets a one. Neutral on me gets a two. Loves me gets a three. Last thing, can they hire me? Are they in a position to hire me or to introduce me to other hiring managers. This is kind of a proxy for are they a senior person or not, but you never know, right? They might be able to hire you if they are at a venture capital firm with 17 different portfolio companies. No, they can't hire you, but they might be able to introduce you to 17 people who can. So that's a three. So one, two, three. Add it all up. This is not rocket science. Do a descending sort by total score. And this is your prioritized network. 
I know this sounds like the most basic exercise, but I will bet dollars to donuts. This is how you're going to find your next job. You're not going to find it from a headhunter. You're not going to find it on a job board and you're not going to find it by banging on doors or cold calling strangers. 90% of jobs, even in good times are found through personal networking. Shame on you if you haven't dug your well already, but the good news is your list is way longer than you thought. Type in the chat box if you agree. Say yes or no. Yes, meaning you get it and you're going to focus on your network and your network is big and juicy and long or no if this is a bunch of crap and you're not going to use it and maybe you're in the wrong place. But I'm convinced this is your number one asset, more important than anything. And by the way, as you type your list, also know that you better dig your well before you're thirsty next time. And also pay it forward. Be a good network to someone, right? Okay, so prioritize your network. Let's keep going. This is, this is going to be your starting point. We're going to circle back to this in a minute. But it doesn't end with just your network because now we're going to think about other places that we might know of opportunities. Again, what most people do is they will talk to every Tom, Dick, and Harry. They will spend time. They'll send cover letters. They'll send click on apply. It doesn't work. And it doesn't work because you are one of thousands, tens of thousands of people who are clicking on apply. Part of the problem with online job boards is they become too easy. You click on apply. I post a job. I get thousands of people. I don't even post anymore because I don't even have the time to go through them. But here's what does work. Creating a list of 30 companies, 30, not five and not 100, that are local or virtual, like we talked about, and that are in a stable or growth sector. Make that list. You can, that, doing the research is easy, right? Google, uh, uh, Crunchbase, um, LinkedIn, however you want to do the research. Add to that list or focus that list on businesses where you have an unfair advantage. I don't mean insider trading, but I mean you know something that would be very useful to them. You actually know the business. You know the industry. By the way, this may not be the time to switch industries. If your industry is stable and doing okay, but you're just tired of it, it may not be the right time to change. Stick with the industry for another year and then make the change. Maybe you have a bunch of people that you worked with in the past and they all went to this particular company. You didn't. Now might be the time to do it. So add that to the list. I encourage you to focus on customers, vendors, and partners, right? They're related to your business. They know you. They can vouch for your performance a lot better than strangers. So you're going to develop this list of 30 companies. And you take that list of 30 companies and research those 30 companies until you can't research them anymore. I know that sounds obvious, but 99% of the people that approach me about a job or one of my clients or, or just you know randomly kind of hit me up for information have done no research. They've spent three minutes on the website, and that's their research. You will differentiate yourself in a very meaningful way to get the audience, right? You got to get the you got to get the meeting. And once you're in the meeting, you will absolutely crush it. If you have researched these 30 companies to death. Now, I know that's scary because that means, well, what happens if I don't? I make a list of 30 companies. I go through all 30 companies and, I've, and I'm empty. Then I'm screwed. And I understand that fear. But I'm telling you that it's not going to happen. By the time you get to company 10 or 12 or 29, you're going to get a great meeting and you're going to crush that meeting because you know more about the company than any person that they are talking to because you've researched it. You'll differentiate yourself in a huge, huge way. Yes, it takes time, but you have nothing but time, right? We're locked at home. I'm not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. Use the time to research the 30 companies. You'll also, by the way, learn a ton and that'll be, you know, great learning anyway. Okay, let's keep going. Once you have identified those companies, you're going to put that company list together with your networking list. And one by one, and this takes a lot of time on LinkedIn, you're going to draw the connections between those 500 people or 1,000 people that you know and these 30 companies. And you're going to look for any personal connection. 
that can possibly get you in the door. I don't care if it's the janitor, the executive assistant, the CEO, a board member, it doesn't matter. Anything is better than a cold call, anything. Refer back to your list in terms of prioritizing, right? You may have three people that are connected to a company, but you already know who is top ranked and you go after that person first. And we'll talk in a minute about how to do that. I'm gonna give you step-by-step step exactly how to do it, okay? But you're drawing these connections. You're playing the matchmaker between who you know and these 30 target companies. In addition to that exercise, I'll give you another uh, tool or another trick. There are so many online uh, vehicles or job boards to find job listings. You know that from career builder to built into LinkedIn, the list is endless. Zip recruiter, Indeed, blah, 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 blah. Absolutely go to those websites. You have nothing to lose and they're free and set up your email job alerts so that it emails you every day when a new job is posted. And if the job was posted more than 38 days ago, it's ancient history. So forget about those. But if it's new and hot and fresh, take it and put it into a Google Sheet or an Excel. You're just looking for the information. You're looking for that this company is hiring this role. And I think I might have an interest and I think it might hit my bullseye of my, of my three Venn diagram. But please, whatever you do, please, please don't click apply. Applying online is not even worth the calorie it takes to click your finger. It will not work. You'll be buried in a stack of resumes. You will, in some cases, go right into a computer database. You think you're applying, but no one will ever see it. I guarantee you. Your job is to go to the top of the pile. You have to go to the top of the stack. And that stack right now can be thousands of people clicking on apply. So you're going to do some detective work, which is especially easy if you've researched the hell out of those 30 companies and mapped out the org structure, which, by the way, you can do super easily in an hour using LinkedIn. You can find every company in that division, every person in that division of that company, even if it's a large company. You can literally draw down an org chart in an hour and figure out who's the hiring manager over that role, who is the boss of that role, who has the pain that is trying to solve it by filling this role. That's not HR, that's not a headhunter, that's not anybody other than the hiring manager. Your job is to figure out who it is. So add that to your Google Sheet. So now we have a real opportunity and a hiring manager. This is sales. If you worked in sales, this that's what this is. We're building a pipeline, right? It's not fun. I didn't promise you sexy. I just promised you how to find a job. Once you know who the hiring manager is, we need to get their email address. That's super easy as well. There are three tools, at least three tools that you can use. You see them here, Lucia, Rocket Reach, and Hire Tool. There's dozens of others. And you put in a couple of bucks and it spits out the person's email address. There's no secrets on email addresses anymore. Okay? So add that to the list too. So now we know about a real fresh opportunity that was just posted. We know the hiring manager we know what the pain is because I researched these companies so intently. I know the biggest issues they're struggling with. And I know the hiring manager's name and email address. You're way ahead of everybody else because you're methodically building a pipeline of opportunities, not just hoping the right thing finds you. So now we got to contact that hiring manager. And I'm going to give you the very specifics on how to do it. Number one is you're going to send an email. You're actually going to send four emails. Most people give up after one email. If you're in email marketing, you know that it often takes up to four contacts, four approaches to get a reply. Why is that? Spam filters, people are busy, people are stressed, people are working at home. Your subject line didn't get their attention. Whatever it is, you need to send four emails. I recommend doing that every other day. So you don't want to be a, a nuisance. So don't do it every day or five times in a day, but every other day over the course of a week. And literally log and track this in like a CRM, right? You can do it in Excel. You don't need to buy our CRM, but you're tracking what you send to whom. The most important thing, the most important thing of that email is to make sure it gets read, which means your subject line has to kick ass and be differentiated. It cannot be. Calg MBA looking for finance manager position. No one will open that. 
It can't be resume attached marketing manager. No one will open that. It needs to be something engaging, 30 characters or less, that makes me say, oh, my God, I have to open this email. And we can talk more about that during Q&A later if you want. I encourage you to send the email at times when no one else is sending them, which is evenings and weekends, not Tuesday at 2 o'clock when her email box is full because she's working at home. She has three kids, and she's managing a department or a company. Send it evenings and weekends. And in that email, whatever you do, don't attach your resume. Don't attach your resume. And you would say, well, why wouldn't I attach my resume? And I will tell you 50 reasons, not the biggest of which is that many spam filters will see that and immediately it goes to spam because they are not going to risk their employees or executives opening an attachment from someone they don't know. Second is resume comes across as desperate and you want to be perceived as from a position of strength. So instead, you include your LinkedIn link, your URL from your dedicated LinkedIn page. That actually will get attention. The individual, if they're impressed by the note, will click on it, and now at least we have a chance. No resume attachment. So what does the email say, right? I can tell you first what it doesn't say. It is not this long and a cover letter that perhaps you wrote, you know, when you were an undergrad and you were sending out cover letters, those days are gone, especially right now in short attention, short attention theater in a pandemic, no one is reading that cover letter. However, what they will read is a five sentence email or three, three to five sentence email that is focused on solving their number one problem. Now, you know their number one problem because you've done research in depth, in detail on these 30 companies. You've read everything you can get your hands on, every news release, any, every news report, every financial report. You've paid attention. You're reading the journal. You understand what they're wrestling with, and you've thought about potential solutions to that problem. Even if they're not the best solutions, you've got something to talk about. If you approach an executive, a CEO, a department head, a private equity investor with a well-written but short, punchy, five-sentence email that talks about the fact you know their biggest problem and you have a potential solution to their biggest problem, and here's a link to my LinkedIn, and I'd love to talk with you for 15 minutes on video, you will be shocked at how many people will say, oh, I actually will be open to that conversation. Do not attach the resume and don't focus on things they don't care about. They don't care about your job search aspirations or your dreams, your career goals that you want to move to California. They don't care. This is not the time for that. That's important to you. I get that. Not important to them. Think about what's important to the customer because this is sales 101 and make sure those five sentences speak to them. And by the way, this is not copy and pasting five sentences. This is literally a customized body of a well-crafted five-sentence email, and it's going to get noticed. It's actually going to break through. The subject line is super important. I'm going to grab a sip of water. Type in the chat box if you're with me. We are rounding third base. I've got some more great stuff to share, and then we will open it up to questions. Okay. Let's keep going. Looks like everyone's with me. I'm getting a lot of yeses. Great. Okay. I mentioned the subject line. It's it's so important. I can't I can't overstate it. In email marketing, the subject line is the most important thing, and it's the last thing most job seekers pay attention to. So it's not a LinkedIn request. It's not a LinkedIn email. It's an email. It's still the best way to do it. And your subject line better hum. You got 30 characters. Make them count. 30 characters because that's the width on most common phones. And if it's 50 characters, it's not going to be seen. It's vital as well in those five sentences to have a call to action. Again, marketing 101. We know our target. We've got our subject line. And we need to ask. You got to ask for the order. Well, what is the order? The order is not a job. The order is not an internship. The order is a 15-minute video call. Why 15 minutes? That is an unintrusive and an unscary amount of time. Don't say a video call. 
that sounds like I'm going to get stuck on the phone with you for an hour. Who knows? I don't have time. My kids are screaming. I'm trying to teach them. I'm trying to do my job. It's too open-ended. 15 minutes, people might have that. A video call, because it's far, far better than a phone call, right? You feel engaged, connected. I can see you. 90% of communication is nonverbal. Now, if they say, let's just hop on the phone, of course, do a phone call. But propose a 15-minute video call because I would love to share with you this solution to your biggest problem. Who is not going to take that follow-up, that, 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 that conversation? Many people will. You can even propose it at shoulder hours, first thing in the morning, last thing in the day, 5 o'clock. I'll even talk to you on a Sunday evening. Whatever works for them is, is, is what you want to do. Think like the customer. Now, you send these, again, four to each contact. And that's going to be a combination of your contact list, the 30 companies, and the list of job opportunities from the job email alerts that we subscribe to. So you're going to be sending emails each day. If you don't keep track of that, you're going to go crazy. You've got to set up an email system in Excel or Google Sheets or something to track all this stuff. As soon as someone says yes, you got a, a fish on the hook, okay? Now, you're going to double down. And you are going to prepare for that phone conversation like it's the most important phone call you will ever have in your entire life. I am talking about five to ten hours of preparation. You get 15 minutes. You know, our careers are made by these little moments. This is one of those moments. If you spend three minutes before the call looking at their website, that call is not going to go well. They won't remember you. They'll be thrilled to get off. But if you have researched and you know their issues better than she does, she'll be blown away. But here's the key. You need to draw the connections for her on why you're the right guy to solve the problem or the right gal. So don't expect her to think through all the connections and all your background and all your experience. You went to Kellogg. Great. That's all noise. Here's your biggest problems. Here's the solution. I've done this before. I can build it for you. I can do it for you as a project. Perhaps I join your team and do it from the inside. Let's talk about how we might work together. You're a consultative salesperson selling a solution to the problem that they have. And believe me, companies have a lot of problems right now. There's no shortage of opportunity. But you got to convince that person in 15 minutes that you can solve the problem, which means understanding and mastering the problem, how you're going to solve it. This is the five to 10 hours of prep. You're thinking through in advance what you're going to say, what their objections are going to be, how you're going to give them comfort that you are the solution to their problem. That 15 minute call is going to go very well. You're going to end it. Actually, let me pause. At the end of 15 minutes, you say, Frank, I told you this would be 15 minutes and I just want to be conscious of your time. It's 15 minutes. Would you like to continue? And many times they will say, yeah, let, let's keep going. I've got plenty of time, right? Hopefully that conversation is going well. Now it's going to go even further. At the end of the call, you agree on next steps. Ask for a next step. Don't be passive. Don't let the employer say, I'll get back to you. We'll talk about next steps. I'll send you an email. Talk about next steps. I'd like to send you uh, a summary of what we just talked about. And I'd like to spend time on an outline of how a project plan. Would that be useful? Do you think that would move us forward in the right direction? Ask for the order. Any order, any bite is, is moving you towards an offer. At the same time, send them the resume. Now, I, before I said don't send a resume. But now you've had a conversation. Now it's possible to actually send a resume that mirrors the exact situation for the company and the role because you've talked with her, you understand as head of marketing, all of her problems, all of her worries, and you can, from your background on your resume, pick out all the experiences that are relevant, all the examples, move them to the top, put them in bold. You, you're you creating a mirror resume. I call it a mirror resume because it mirrors the job opportunity. It's like the two halves just kind of go together and talk about how you can create value for her company, for her department. <laughs> Now, before we get too much further, I want to talk about the video interview because for many of you, you might be interviewing on video for the very first time. I've been interviewing on video candidates for eight years. 
And it is very different. It's a different kind of feel than being in person. Uh, so here are some things that you got to remember to do. First of all, check the technology. It's not going to work. Assume it's not going to work. So don't log on at two o'clock hoping it's going to work. You get on at 150, you make sure it's working, you see how you look, and you beg your family or bribe them to free up bandwidth, get off uh, uh, you know, the streaming services, get off the video games, go have lunch, but you need as much bandwidth as you can. Reboot your computer, shut down all your applications. Once you're on the video, it's important to have eye contact and engage. And that means looking at the camera, not looking at your screen. So the temptation is to look at the screen where the image of the other person is. You're looking at the camera, which means you're not looking at them. It is far more important for you to look at them and look at them in the eye, which means looking at the camera than it is for you to see their image. And that, again, will be off-putting. I encourage you to do a mock interview with someone that you trust. I do these all the time because for a lot of people, it's the first time they've done it. So just make sure that you nailed that 15 minutes. You only get one shot. You also want to think about what to wear. Don't wear a suit because that looks ridiculous. You're at home in a pandemic. Everyone knows it. But don't wear a torn T-shirt. So you kind of want to find something in between. Okay. you got to master that video interview and you kind of have a couple days to do it. So really think about how to do it. And I encourage you to do a mock interview with somebody that you trust. That'll be honest feedback. You can actually record it if it's on Zoom and you'll be blown away by what you see. There are two things that you want to make sure you have ready at hand for the video interview. Before I tell you what those are, I want to make sure you're with me. Type in the chat box, yes, please. We got five minutes left. We're going to get it done in time, just about, and then we'll open up to questions. And I know there's a ton of questions because you guys have been typing them. Um, so just type in the chat box if you're with me on the video interview. Awesome. Okay, let's keep going. Great. Two things you want to have ready. Most people don't do this. The first, your SARs. SAR. What is an SAR? SAR is situation, action, result. Situation, action, result. For every position you've ever had, every role at every company, what is the situation you stepped into? Was it a raw startup? Was it a turnaround situation? Was it just keep it going and don't screw it up? What was the situation you stepped into? What were the two or three key actions that you took? And then what were the results? I don't want a laundry list of the actions you took. I don't want to know the 80-step plan that you put in place. What were the two or three big things that moved the needle, no matter what the role was, and what were the results? Quantified. you got to know your numbers. People expect you to know your numbers. And yes, even from a job 10 years ago, brush up and refresh yourself on the numbers. Everyone wants metrics. It is credible proof. If you made President's Club, I want to know how you made President's Club, and you beat the number by 10%, but how did you do it? That's a lot better than saying, oh, I was in President's Club, right? Because you've given me proof. So have your SARs ready. Now, the neat thing about a video inter interview is you can literally tape it on the screen right next to the camera. So you can have it right in front of you like a cheat sheet. Go for it. Who's going to know? The second thing is your references. A lot of people wait to pull this together at the last second when they're first asked and it's late because you're late in the process. Believe me, if they're asking for references, that's an amazing buying signal. In fact, sometimes you might want to volunteer the references before they even ask. That tells the person that you're serious and that you're credible. Check, you're saying, check me out. Talk to these people. But you need to have that pulled together in advance. That's every boss you've had in the past 10 years. And if they're going to say bad things about you. I can guarantee you that the employer or their headhunter is going to track it, track it down on LinkedIn. So you might as well know what they're going to say because that's a backdoor reference. And that's in my book in Chapter 7 if you want to see how that works. But have the references, email address, mobile number, all pulled together in advance. Okay, let's keep going. All of this is to break through the noise. When you click apply online, this is what you're going to be perceived as. You just, you know, it's, it's that kind of market, even during good times, 
when people post a job, on average, they get 300. Now there are companies getting 3,000 applications. Don't go to the black hole. You got to get to the top of the stack. And it's not about how good your resume is. It's about all these other things that we spent the past 50 minutes talking about. Now, part of that is your LinkedIn profile because that link that's going to be in the email to each hiring manager, the scary thing is it only gets six seconds. They've done all the data, all the research. Your average LinkedIn profile gets a six second review. So it's got to be super sharp. And I see a lot of people mess these up too. It must have quantifiable metrics. It doesn't matter what role you are in, what kind of situation, you must quantify and focus on achievements, not job descriptions. So if you list product manager and then you waste space explaining what you did, that's silly. Everyone knows what a product manager is because I'm the VP of product management and you're sending me a link to your LinkedIn. Tell me what you did. Launched four products in 17 months that increased revenue 38%. Bam, I want to talk to that person. How did you actually create value? And it's important. It's the, it, the onus is on you to figure that out and tell people, not for them to dig through and figure it out for themselves. And again, you get six seconds. The two photos at the top, I could you know, do a whole other session on those. There's, of course, your face shot. There's the other photo behind it. And you need to think about what are the unspoken objections? Everyone's story has gaps. I took two years off to raise kids. I ran for political office. I did this, that, and the other. But think about what the unspoken objections are going to be and proactively address them to take them off the table. you got to tell that story in six seconds. It's hugely important. We're right at the top of the hour. I understand you may be nervous, but a lot of people are paralyzed. You can't allow yourself to fall into paralysis. That's death. That's panic. You gotta have a plan. So here's a summary of the plan based on your situation. If you're currently working, I would, I would encourage you to stay if at all possible. If it's a safe port in the storm, even if it's not your dream job and your lifelong ambition, right now you're gonna get a hall pass. Think three times before you make a move, especially to a company that may be less stable. Dig your well before you're thirsty. Don't let this happen again. Work on your network. Remember that whole prioritized network exercise we went through. And be generous. Make a lot of introductions. Do a lot of favors. Okay? Second, if you're nervous, if you're nervous about the stability of your job, your company, create a plan and take action. The reason this is important is as the waves move through the recession and through industry after industry, the people that are late to make a move are the ones that get hurt the most. They're the last in, so they're gonna be the first out. And then they go to another company, last in, first out. I saw this during the dot-com boom and the dot-com bust. It's really sad. If you're nervous, if you do the math and you know your burn rate isn't where it needs to be, either at home or at work, you gotta have this plan by Friday. And I've given you the steps on how to do it. Now, if you're not working, if you're currently between gigs, that's fine. Be really clear on your MVP that we talked about, your minimum viable position, and accept the first one that passes that bar. In the meantime, to reduce your stress, to reduce your anxiety, and to reduce your burn rate, definitely take on project work. I'm not saying take on crap work, but if you can find a gig at 20 bucks an hour, 50 bucks an hour, 100 bucks an hour, do it because it will lengthen your runway, reduce your stress. And by the way, quite often those projects turn into the next project, which turn into a full-time job. It's like a test drive, which is chapter six in the book. Okay. So those are kind of a, a very simple summary of what we've talked about. Now it's helpful to have an advisor. I get that. I can't be an advisor to a ton of people because of just time. And my day job is doing executive search and I work on searches, but I have developed a very, very simple service called LinkedIn makeover. If it's of interest to you, great. If not, that's fine. But a lot of people, their LinkedIn really needs some help. So I do a one-hour video meeting. It's super short, 30 minutes. You get me, you don't get my team. And we're actually going to drill into your LinkedIn profile. I'll even give you a, a recorded copy, a video of the session. So you can actually focus on what we're doing, not scrambling to write it all down. And we'll nail it. We'll nail your profile. I'll help you make sure that your LinkedIn profile is discoverable so it'll be found because there's a whole key to doing that. And I'll help you tell the story, right? I've seen 
30,000 interviews, I've heard these stories and I can help you tell that story in six seconds, which will help you get the meeting because that LinkedIn uh, link is going to be in your emails, right? So I won't tolerate wallowing. We're not going to spend time. Woe is me. We're going to actually get to it and do those things. So if you're interested in LinkedIn makeover, you can check that out. Uh, I'm booked already through next Thursday. So I'm doing as many as I can, but uh, if you're interested, take a look. It's recruitrockstars.com slash job. Recruitrockstars.com slash job. So with all that, I'm ready to open up for questions. Seven o'clock central, just like I promised. Uh, I'll take as many as I can. I'll go all night if you want. Let's start with the first one from Patrick. How do you suggest connecting with key folks on LinkedIn? What's the best message in the connection request? Connecting with people on LinkedIn uh, has become very difficult. You know, it was a novelty five years ago, 10 years ago, and now it's just a mishmash. And a lot of people are at their wits end. They don't even check their inbox. So I wouldn't rely on that strategy of connecting people to actually advance you. If you want to advance and there's someone specifically, send them an email. We talked about how to do that and make it worth their while to connect with you. Uh, next, uh, Ron asked, what's your advice for an industry change and a lower level position? I'm all for it. If your industry is one that is in trouble or one that's going to experience trouble over the next year, get out now and switch industries. And that may mean taking a lower level position and that's fine. Work your way back up. Just get in the door, show them what you can do and make it happen. Next from Jenna, how do you identify virtual remote only companies? There's a bunch of websites, job boards that are virtual and remote only companies. So you can look at Google for those job boards. And in LinkedIn, you can now actually search for opportunities that are virtual and remote. There's a checkbox, so you can look for those. Um, Dan, what are the keys to the email subject line? So, you know, Google a couple of articles on writing a subject line. Uh, for for emails, and by the way, this will, this will help you in so many ways. Uh, but it, it needs to drive intrigue and curiosity. When your email subject line is curious and makes me wonder, like, huh? I open the email. If it gives me the whole punchline, I don't open it. If I'm not interested in that thing, so you have to beg curiosity. There's a lot of ways to do that: humor, drama. Right. But you get 30 characters personalized, not copy and paste, not VP of marketing looking for a job resume attached. No one is going to open that email. But I've got the biggest solution to your problem. I've cracked the code on your brand strategy. I'm just brainstorming here, but make it personal and direct to that person. Next question from Diana. What do you think the future holds for recruiters who got laid off and want to stay in the industry? So recruiters obviously are having a tough time. Many uh, recruiters, there's 90,000 recruiters in the U.S. alone, uh, 150,000 worldwide, and they're going to have a tough time. Um, so for those folks, I'd encourage you to think about switching to outplacement, work with candidates, help them write their resume, help them uh, prepare their job search strategy, introduce them to companies. A lot of companies are hiring outplacement people to help all the people that they're laying off. So outplacement is, an, is a great example. Um, Oliver says, when looking for internal company opportunities, would you use the same strategy or find to find a new position? Oh, uh, so Oliver is looking at other positions in his company exactly the same, except it's a little easier, right? Because those people will definitely take your call. You find out what department or what function or what division you want to be in. You find the hiring manager, you crack their biggest problems. And if you don't know their biggest problems, ask. Say, I work in this division. We're wrestling with this. I'm curious, what are your biggest problems and things you're working through? And read everything you can get your hands on to crack the code on their biggest problem. Next from Deborah, uh, I am a nonprofit advancement professional, ready to move into an executive director role. My current nonprofit's in good shape, but my dream job just opened up. Should I consider staying put? Well, if it, I'm a little confused. The dream job opened up, opened up at another company. So sure, pursue it, but don't join that other company or nonprofit unless they are rock solid, strong balance sheet, great low burn rate, right? You don't want to take a risky position 
even if it seems better than your current situation. Uh, let's go to the next question. Um, Elizabeth, if guidance is to send four emails to key targets, how should each of those emails evolve? Great question. Um, generally, keep the body the same and use four different subject lines. That's what professional email marketers do. So you, you nail that body, right? Three to five sentences like we talked about. But if they didn't open the subject line the first time, why would you send the same subject line the second time? It doesn't make sense. So instead, change it. Right, so if the first one was a little bit funny, the second one's a little bit more curious, so the third one has their name in it, things like that. Change four different subject lines. Uh, next question uh, from Oliver. I was planning for months to move internally. Would you still stay put or explore internal options? You know, internal options are a little safer than switching companies, but not necessarily, right? Because again, there's no emotional connection. If you switch divisions, yeah, you work for the company, but they don't know you. And so they're not going to think twice about parting ways if the business turns south. So again, bird in the hand is worth a lot in the bush. Um, next question from Billy. How do you check in or nudge a company that you were interviewing with, but it's been put on hold? If it's been put on hold, your nudging is not going to change anything. Your time is far better spent uh, building your pipeline. You know, a great salesperson knows that you build a pipeline that's three times your quota and you're guaranteed to hit your quota. So rather than dicking around with deals that are already in your pipeline, get more deals, right? More at-bats. Next question. Um, Ron, age 64, just retired, but I still want to work. Any recommended approach? I don't see anything different about what I've discussed, Ron, uh, that, that I would do differently if you're 24 or 64, right? There's a lot of companies right now that will pay for experience. I'm actually finding that companies are open to a whole range of people they weren't open to before. If you can prove that you've seen this storm before or you've solved this problem before or you've, see, or you've seen this movie before, that's worth a lot. So I think the issue is just targeting and thinking about who you're going after. Uh, next, uh, from Mike, can I engage in this process without reading your book? Sure, don't read my book if you're too busy. Uh, so that's not a problem. Next question from Elizabeth. How do I approach positioning myself? If I'm in an unstable industry, but I just joined in the past 90 days, it feels risky to leap quickly. So if you just landed in the last 90 days, your priority should be to stick with it. But if your analysis of the burn rate and the risk level says that this is not going to last, we are not going to make it. Maybe you didn't do all your due diligence. And now that you're on the inside, you're finding the numbers are pretty ugly. Then you need to take your chances and you need to begin that search. Again, don't don't give notice. Don't quit before you line up your next opportunity. But uh, it's time. It's time to start. When the platform is burning, you got to make a move. Next, from Deborah. During the video interview, how can you gauge how you're being received if you look at the camera and not the interviewer? So yeah, that's a fair question. Well, first of all, do some dry runs and video them so you can see yourself in action. So don't don't let your 15 minutes of fame be your first time doing it. Right. Do a whole bunch with a friend, with your mom, tape it, whatever. Um, and then when you're having the conversation, it's okay to occasionally glance down, um, but you can position the window. Like I've got my little window of how I look, and I'm not much to look at, but I've got it right by the camera. I can see how I look right now. So the point is to not have it down on the screen, have it up by the camera. And by the way, this is a good angle, having the camera up. Most of us look very flattering. All your chins disappear. Your hair looks great. When your uh, camera is up, it's really imposing. It's not. It's not a great angle. Uh, okay, I think. I think I've got them all. Are there any other questions? Last call before we all get on to dinner, or maybe uh, an adult beverage. Are there any other questions? Okay. One last one. Uh, from Jenna, how understanding are employers of being laid off due to COVID-19? You have the biggest, biggest hall pass in the history of your career. Everyone understands that if you've been laid off, it's probably no fault of your own. You are not a label. It is not an excuse. Go for it. I wish you the best. Let's make it happen. Great to spend time with you this evening.
And again, you'll get a survey about this webinar. We'd love your feedback. Thank you so much to the Kellogg Alumni Board for inviting me, the Kellogg Alumni Chicago Board, and have a great, great, safe evening.